Hey everybody, it's Matt Bowles here, Maverick Investor Group. We're ready to uh, kick off a very exciting webinar this evening. We have with us for the hour, Diane Kennedy, uh, who many of you I'm sure are very familiar with, but uh, I'm going to introduce her and some of her accolades here in a minute. I just want to welcome everybody uh, and give you a couple housekeeping items up front. Uh, everybody has a control panel uh, on their screen here, and uh, that control panel allows you uh, to type questions into the question box. We are going to take the questions at the end. Uh, you're going to be able to ask uh, any questions you want to Diane Kennedy, uh, and she will uh, be able to answer them live, which is a really exciting opportunity. So think about uh, some really good questions. A lot of the stuff that you may ask will likely be covered in the webinar. So if you can hang on to most of your questions until the end, uh, that's when we're going to take all of them uh, and have uh, Diane here to answer them. Uh, there's also a hand icon that you have on your control panel there, allows you to raise your hand. So let's try this just as an example. How many people here on the webinar have been to uh, a Maverick event before? Uh, meaning this is not your first Maverick event, you have been to a webinar, either a buying opportunity webinar uh, or some other Maverick event uh, on the webinar before. Just raise your hand, click on that hand icon. We're going to test, make sure they're all working okay. Um, a lot of folks, of course, in our community uh, tuning into this uh, that I recognize here. Uh, some new faces, though. Uh, so for some folks, this is your first Maverick event. And for those people, we'd like to uh, give you a very warm first time Welcome. Uh, this uh, event is not a Maverick buying opportunity. There's not a real estate uh, offering on this webinar. This is what we call uh, a sort of a Maverick advisor webinar, and uh, I'm really excited about our guest tonight. One of the things about Maverick Investor Group is that we are a community of real estate investors. So in addition to providing you access to turnkey real estate investment properties in the best markets that allow you to uh, build your wealth through real estate. We also want to provide you access to some of the top experts in the field uh, relating to real estate and different aspects of it, things that are important to you so that we can bring you uh, educational events like the one tonight uh, which can support you in your real estate investing. So I'm super excited to introduce Diane Kennedy. I've known Diane now for over five years, uh, which Diane and I have known each other. And uh, in that time, uh, I can tell you that I have uh, read all of her books uh, that you see here. She's a, a very prolific uh, author. She's a best-selling author. Uh, and this is some of the most substantive uh, work relating to uh, a real estate tax strategy that you will find out there, certainly that I have ever seen. Uh, so I've bought all her books, I've read them, they're on my bookshelf, underlined and all that stuff. I've been to a lot of Diane's live seminars uh, and uh, Diane Kennedy is also uh, my personal uh, CPA and she is the CPA of Maverick Investor Group. So uh, as a result of our long-term relationship, uh, she has agreed to come on for an hour tonight uh, and share with you some of the latest updates uh, in terms of both the tax law and also the way that the tax law is being enforced and how that affects uh, real estate investors and real estate professionals. Okay, So one of the great things about these updates uh, when they and does them is that she really is in the trenches. She really studies this stuff. Most CPAs are not going to be as knowledgeable about the minutia uh, of tax law and the enforcement of, of tax law as it affects real estate investors, real estate professionals, and so forth. Dan Kennedy, on the other hand, specializes in this space. She herself has been a professional real estate investor for over 30 years. She has been a, a business owner for over 30 years. She owns multiple businesses. Uh, and of course, she is, is widely regarded as the preeminent uh, CPA in the country, uh, particularly on these issues. So she, her clientele is made up of small business owners and real estate investors. That's what she specializes in. And she's come to us tonight uh, to share some of the latest uh, knowledge uh, with you in terms of things you need to avoid and also things that you can be doing uh, to make things more advantageous for yourself 
from a tax perspective uh, uh, in your real estate investing and your real estate endeavors. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, give the keyboard and mouse over to Diane as we speak. Uh, I'm going to let her take you through a really awesome presentation uh, on the latest uh, uh, the latest stuff. And uh, without further ado, I'll bring her on. And uh, welcome to the webinar tonight, Diane Kennedy. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Matt. I always enjoy talking to your people. It's it's great to talk to people who really get real estate. And, you know, that's the reason why I refer my clients to you when they're looking for investment properties. But, you know, we're talking today about taxes. And, you know, I know that there's people on the call today, and I see we've got a lot of people on the call. And there's some of you that have been around real estate for a long time. And th there might be kind of an idea, it's like, I know this stuff. And I absolutely know you know this stuff like four years ago. But during this time when the real estate market has gotten a little soft in some areas, the IRS has gotten really aggressive. And there's been some tax law changes and additionally some ways they handle audits of real estate investors and real estate professionals that's changed. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, first of all, just kind of quickly, the things we're going to be talking about are really general in nature. And so, you know, as always, we want to make sure that if you've got clients that are real estate, if you're an agent and you've got clients that are investors, you're cautioning them to talk to their own accountant and for you too to make sure that you're talking to an accountant how that fits your particular scenario. Okay, let's talk about the number one mistake that I'm seeing right now. And this is what we, I'm calling it the wrong income and loss category. And let me demonstrate this with a story from back in the early 2000s is before real estate took that real big run up. Um, I had a client that came in to me as a married couple, and they're both really smart people. They were both doctors. They worked a lot of hours, and they didn't want to do that forever. That's why they were becoming real estate investors. And they knew that from Robert Kiyosaki that I was his CPA and that, that he was so um, associated with real estate, they decided they're going to do that too. And they wanted to get all the same tax breaks that he talked about. But, you know, like I said a minute ago, everybody's situation is different. And the problem was they were both full-time MDs, so they weren't going to get to take advantage of some of the, the breaks we're going to talk about tonight. But in that very first meeting, they had a really simple question. They were trying to figure out how to do cash on cash return. And you know, cash on ca cash return refers to the amount of cash that you have on an annual basis, just cash flow. It doesn't have anything to do with net income. You divide that by the amount of cash that you put into the investment. It's a very simple back of the envelope uh, calculation. These are smart people. They couldn't figure it out. Well, as we get to talking, the reason was that they didn't have a cash flow coming to them. They had paid too much for the property. They'd had to put about 80000 into it to fix it up out of cash and there was no annual cash flow. The debt was higher than their rent was. They had to pay every month to keep a tenant in the property. Now, this is back in the days when they shouldn't have had to do that. Now, the problem was there was no cash flow flowing to them, so the calculation doesn't work. And the reason I use that example is these are really smart people, and they didn't get that basic fundamental on real estate investing. And the sad thing is, is I see people that maybe understand the real estate investing, but real estate taxes even more complicated. It, it, the problem is, is that there's a number of different ways to categorize that income or loss that you can get. So that's what we're going to start with right now. So first thing to look at is we've got a choice of you've, when you've got income or loss, it could be either capital or an ordinary. Now, when I say an ordinary income or loss, let's, let's assume that we have a loss. If there's an ordinary loss while you're holding property and it's considered a business loss, you can deduct 100% of that loss against your in income, assuming you have enough basis. Now, what that basically means is for some people, they might have a property that, say, is a vacation rental. If they rent it in time, per time periods that are less than seven days and provide some services like housekeeping, maid service, that type of thing, it actually isn't considered what we call the regular real estate loss. It's a real estate business. And the importance of that is, is that, that then if there's a, a deduction of loss, and when I keep saying loss, what I'm talking about is a paper loss. By the time you take advantage of depreciation and all your expenses and all the other great things you get a write-off with real estate, if it becomes a business loss, you've got a 100% deduction. Now, on the other hand, if it's something that you're renting longer term, then you've got that passive loss. 
Now, this is the, the, play, the part where a lot of people get tripped up. Because if you make less than $100,000 per year, and you have some kind of participation in the property, then you get to take a deduction of up to $25,000 of that loss against other income. If you make over $150,000, you can't take any of that loss. Between 100 and 150, it phases out. Now, the big deduction on this, the, the big kind of exception in this, is something called the real estate professional status. If, if you're the real estate professional, then that means you get to take, on, take advantage of 100% of that loss. Now, I know that we've got real estate agents on the call today. Guess what? You guys qualify as real estate professionals. Now, taking that deduction, though, has gotten a little trickier, and we're going to go through that a little later in the webinar to make sure that you, you've got all your I's dotted and your T's crossed because the IRS is really focusing in on that one. Um, the other question, though, is let's say you're selling the property. You're selling it. You're going to have either a gain or loss on the sale. It's going to either be a capital gain or loss or an ordinary gain or loss. If you've put the property into service, so it's been rented, it's then considered ordinary. So you'd have ordinary income or ordinary loss, which means it can go to offset your other income. If it's never put into service, say you buy a piece of property and then it just uh, sits there, um, you, you know, it's, you're holding it for, you're hoping a road comes through or whatever. It, it would then be considered an investment, not put in service. So if you sell it, you've got a capital gain. If you sell it and it's a loss, then you have a capital loss, which is going to be limited to just $3,000 per year. Okay, I have just one slide, and I, I hope you realize how many different choices there are when it comes to the income and losses with the property. So a lot has to do with how you handle the property. And, you know, I run into people that say, I own real estate. What's my deduction? And it's like, well, is it a business? Is it passive? Is it a capital gains? Is it going to be an ordinary loss? What, what is the nature of the property you've got? Um, with this, this particular spot, we're just going to move on from here. But hopefully it gives you an idea of some of the questions that you need to think about before you start putting a strategy together with your real estate. Um, I'm going to share just another big one that we talked about is um, that there's no strategy when there is going to be that loss. It, it, real estate's got one huge tax advantage over a business, and that advantage is depreciation. And I call it a phantom expense because it doesn't cost you a dime. You just get to take the deduction. But remember when we talked about those passive loss limitations, now this is critical because if you're caught in that spot where you don't get to take advantage of the losses, then maximizing additional losses by maybe maximizing or front end loading your depreciation doesn't make sense. Um, an example here, I had a new client who had, was just about to quit his day job and become a real estate professional full time. Prior to that, he'd been a really highly paid specialist he spent all of his time at the job. So he didn't qualify as a real estate professional. He made over 150000 So all of his losses that he had on those properties, those paper losses, were just suspended. They were just moved forward to a future day. Well, he'd read some of my books about real estate, and I, and I talk about how you can maximize your depreciation, how you can front end load it, take it at certain times, be very strategic with when you use it. And he said, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to really front end load my depreciation, take it all now. So he paid his existing CPA, who didn't understand any of this. He paid him to learn how to do what I was telling him, and then they did it. And so they maximized the depreciation. They did what's called a catch-up provision to catch up prior depreciation. So he had this huge loss, paper loss, in a year when he couldn't take it. So it became a huge suspended loss. Now, the sad thing is he did this all the year before he quit his job to become a real estate professional. If he'd waited one more year, we could have saved him tens of thousands of dollars in taxes. In fact, I think the number was close to $100,000 in taxes. But because he'd taken it and he'd done it early, it was just suspended up until a future day when he gets to take advantage of it. So th there's a challenge with not having a good strategy or not fully understanding what it is you want to create. And I'd like to say that losses can actually be cash in your pocket as long as you know how to use them and when to use them. Now, and just a note here, I know nobody's buying property expecting to lose money on it. Um, th when I'm talking about these negative cash flowing and the paper losses, it is the depreciation I'm talking about. I mean, I want everybody to go out and get property that's got huge cash flow 
and we get to use depreciation to offset all of that and maybe even create some additional losses that can go against it. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Um, just a concept, we talked about that suspended losses. That in the case of the guy that had quit his, quit his job and he unfortunately took all these losses a little early, you may have some suspended losses right now on some property or you might run into some people that do. Now, there's three ways that you can immediately start working on those suspended losses to turn them into cash. One is sell, sell the property. Now, I, I don't ever recommend somebody makes a decision like that just based on the tax consequences, but if you do sell a property, suspended losses are immediately deducted. Another one is, and this is the one I like better, is to offset that loss against other real estate income. So if they go get some properties that are really cash flowing, that are making some money, they get to shelter it with these suspended losses that are sitting there. And then number three is, is to get your income below $100,000. And in this case, I'm not talking about going out and working less, but maybe being a little strategic with maybe a big pension contribution, maybe using a different business structure, maybe starting another business and having a bunch of startup expenses, it, provided that's something you wanted to do anyway. But if there's some things you can do to get that income below the 100000 then we get to go into that suspended losses at that, remember I mentioned that $25,000 a year. I, I know I'm running through this stuff fast, and we, uh, I know Matt is also recording this, so you'll be able to go back, and we're going to take some questions at the end. So the, the bottom line is with all of this, there are strategic things you can do now. The IRS is watching, though. You need to really make sure you're following the rules on this. The, the question that I probably run into the most is for people that are high-income employees, and they're looking at, you know, starting this next year, we're going to see our tax rates probably jump up. We've got a new Medicare surtax coming up. There's, um, they've lost equity in their houses. They're trying to figure out how that it can increase. The, the costs are going up. You know what to do. I, my favorite strategy right now is to have my clients invest in real estate and start a side business as well, because the business gives you better immediate deductions. The real estate is providing that passive income for the future. Maybe not quite the immediate bang that we, you know, back in the days when we used to flip, but. It, it, the bottom line is that this creates a longer wealth building strategy with passive income, couple that with a business. I think that's the best way for employees, people that still have jobs today. Um, the, the third mistake that I run into is if there's been a real estate foreclosure, a you know, deed in lieu of, a short sale, you know, any of those things where you, there's been property that's been dumped, the IRS is getting really tough on this one. Um, let me just give you one example. You'll see the form numbers you need to know, 1099A, 1099C, 982. Don't worry about that. These are things that your tax preparer should be able to help you with. The form 1099A, though, there's been a change that the IRS is doing now that, that not all tax preparers know about because they aren't writing it. It's a change in how they perform their audit. The form 1099 is given to you when a property is taken back. So if there's been a foreclosure or a deed in lieu of, you'll get a 1099A. It shows the amount of the debt, the fair market value, and says whether you are personally liable. Now, in the past, the Form 1099A was mainly the way that it was reported that a property was disposed. And at this moment, with that form, you don't know if there's going to be any forgiveness of debt. Forgiveness of debt, also known as cancellation of debt, is taxable to you. So if you walk on a property and they forgive some debt, it's taxable to you. Now, don't fall off your chair if this has happened to you because there's some ways around it. If you've had bankruptcy, if you're insolvent, um, if you've got, if it's a principal residence. But those, there's, those things, those situations won't make it, it won't be taxable to you, but you have to properly file that. Now, the thing though was is that we were always waiting for that report of the cancellation of debt, that Form 1099-C. Now, remember, the 1099-A is what you get when they've walked, you've walked on the property and you, the lender gives it to you. But this is the change. The IRS is now taking the position that if you had this foreclosure, this deed in lieu of, in a state that doesn't have recourse debt, then you have cancellation of debt right now. Um, in other words, that let's say you have a property in California, and in a lot of cases, California does not have a recourse debt. And so what they're saying is, okay, there was a property that there was a debt of 150000 on, and it's only worth 100 now. 
Therefore, there's a $50,000 cancellation debt that you owe right now, even though the lender never reported it. Now, the, the, there's a lot of reasons that I think this is a problem, and I think we're going to see the IRS getting overturned in this. Uh, again, though, let me say that this is the position the IRS is taking right now. I, I think that some of the things that are wrong is it doesn't follow the rules. The lenders are supposed to do a 1099-C, and because there's been so much problem with them, they're not doing it. I think that's why the IRS is trying to kind of cut them out of the equation and just go directly to the taxpayer. But I think it's putting a burden on the taxpayer with to report something that you may not know. For example, they, they might have reported a fair market value on a property and then six months later sold it for a fraction of that. So the cancellation of debt amount was actually much bigger. Or maybe they got more money than they thought, in which case the cancellation of debt is much smaller. At any rate, it's just a guess at this point, and the lender doesn't have any more information than you have and probably has less in trying to come up with that. But that's what the IRS is doing right now. So this could be a challenge moving forward. Just be aware of it. And if it looks like you need to report it, I would say go ahead and report it. And then take one of those exceptions where you're insolvent on the properties or you know whatever it is through the Form 982. That's that other form that you see, one of the forms you see on the slide. That's how you report the properties that, and the uh, debt forgiveness that you don't have to pay tax on. Um, just kind of as a comment on this, this last February, I put together a new program called the Real Estate Accountant in a Box. Now, what we did is it had a special price on a number of home study courses and specific guidelines for the accounting and tax preparation and how do you do the uh, find all of those tax deductions that are legal. And part of that, there was a section that was for the distressed real realty. So uh, there was how do you handle if you've got 1099As, how do you handle if you've got 1099As. C's. If you were one of the people that purchased this back then, you would have by now received a notice from us already because we updated all of this information. This is a new stance that the IRS has taken just this last month. And so we've updated all of the material on how to handle it now with those strategies. And part of what we like to do, uh, especially with our real estate clients, is make sure they've got the latest information. So if you buy this from us, you would have gotten the update that said that this was it. And uh, at the end of this, I'm going to also talk a little bit about what this pro program is. And we're, we have an offer just for people that are coming through Matt's organization right now. But just as a comment, if you have any information that's prior to a month ago, it, it probably doesn't have this new stuff in it, and you need to know that. OK, mistake number four. Uh, this is when you get involved in real estate investing and maybe pay a lot of attention to my material, I'll say, or I talk about income taxes. And I'll be honest, I don't always talk about the other taxes. So what I want to do is just take a minute to talk about some of the other taxes you need to be concerned about when you're doing asset protection and setting up tax deductions with your real estate properties. First one, transfer tax. With real estate, it's one of the most common areas that I see people making mistakes. If they fail to take into account transfer taxes when they move properties around. I mean, there are some states, like Florida comes to mind, that has some really high transfer taxes. So if you sell a property to an arm's length buyer, it's just a regular, pro a regular deal, the transfer tax is the buyer's issue. But when you start transferring maybe into your own LLC, you would think, okay, it's still my, I'm still the owner. It should be a free transfer, right? Unfortunately, many states they have taken the position that it's not a free transfer. They treat that transfer just as though you were selling the property to an unrelated party and are going to charge the full transfer tax value all over again. Arizona comes to mind. It's one of those states that is doing this. Now, why? It's because in many instances, once you move a piece of real estate into an LLC, the state loses control over its ability to tax further transfers of that property. So there's no mechanism in place to know who the owners of that LLC are. And so they don't know when the ownership transfers. So if an LLC owns a piece of property and then people sell the membership interest in the LLCs, they don't ever have to pay transfer tax again. And let's face it, that's a strategy that's been used. Now, but for the states, they don't want to see you doing that transfer tax free. So they're going to try to make you pay every time they can. So whenever possible, 
it is best to take title to your real estate in your LLC to begin with. So if you're using a business structure to protect your property, take title in it to begin with. Don't do it first in your name and then move it over. Or if you do, just make sure you know what the transfer tax is going to be on that situation. Another one that a lot of people are talking about these days are land trusts. Actually, land trusts have been around for a while. It's, the idea is land trusts are a special type of trust where the property is titled into a trustee's name. And the trustee is kind of like a figurehead. They don't have the powers a trustee would have in a regular trust. In a land trust, it's the beneficiary who calls the shots. And beneficiaries can be easily changed without touching the title to real estate. Now, these became, land trusts became popular in the early 2000s. And the, mainly the reason was that you could assume other people's debt with that. Now, what's happened is, is we've seen some states put legislation in place that require owners to voluntarily disclose changes in that beneficiary, in the beneficial ownership. Um, if you don't do that, you could lose your asset protection with the land trust. The whole thing could blow up. Um, also, some states are demanding to see full trust documents before they're allowing any transfer tax exemption. See, with the trust, you typically get an exemption with the transfer tax. Now they're wanting to see the full documentation so they can see if this is really a land trust. And if so, then they're going to assess a regular transfer tax. That's a problem because typically trust documents are supposed to be private. But states are taking the position that if you don't show the documents, then they're just going to assess you the tax anyway. And it kind of leaves you in this no-win situation. By the way, if you're thinking, well, that's not how it used to be a couple of years ago, absolutely. These are changes that are occurring right now, and I think largely because we're seeing so many states that are broke right now. Mistake number five, um, making stupid and illegal <laughs> tax reporting errors. You know, I talked a little bit about the limitation on taking real estate losses at the very beginning. It's been 25 years since the 1986 Tax Reform Act. And I don't know how many people on the call today remember it, but I remember that because I've been practicing for longer than that. And there's been a there hasn't been a big sweeping change to real estate tax since then. But there's been a lot of little laws, court cases, procedural changes, and they've been taking away that tax advantage as most Americans have, unless you're working full-time in real estate. So it can come as a shock to some real estate investors to discover they're not getting the deductions they think they should. And like I always say, after the pl fact, planning rarely works. Planning is supposed to happen early. Now, so what sometimes happens is people find themselves after the fact going, wait a second, I thought I was getting in these deductions, and I'm not. So now I'm going to do something that is at best stupid and at worst illegal. So here's some of the things that can really get people in trouble. Um, forcing the tax program. Now, one of the free services that I offer is a review of past tax returns to see if there's any glaring errors and see if I can save any tax money in the future. Now, a common mistake I see with people who prepare their own returns people who had real estate investments and made a lot of money, you know, over that 150000 is that they're trying to force the tax programs to create the return they think they should. They think there's something wrong with the return. I should be getting this deduction. So the problem is that usually these programs let you do that kind of thing. You can color outside the lines. But the problem is if you're not a CPA and you don't have the experience, I've got to say don't override your tax program. Usually there's a reason why it's not letting you do that. Um, another, some of the ways that I see that done is, okay, you report your real estate rentals on a Schedule E. Now, if there's a loss, a passive loss, that goes over to Form 8582. Don't worry about these numbers. But that's the form we, excuse me, we use to, to, to calculate the passive loss. Now, the only exception is if you've completed the bottom of the Schedule E as a real estate professional. Now, some people uh, who are doing the return themselves get a little confused and say, wait a second, I'm a real estate professional. Diane said I should be able to get this deduction. They don't complete the bottom of the Schedule E, but they override it and don't let it go to Form 8582. If you do that, you are asking for an audit because it's going to pop out when the IRS sees, the computer sees that return. So if you are a real estate professional, make sure you're com properly completing the part that says you're a real estate professional. Um, another one, one that kind of can get people in trouble is they realize, wait a second, these limitations are coming because I'm reporting it as a rental on Schedule C. 
what if I just go ahead and move it over to Schedule C, the business one? Now, early on I talked about how you can have real estate that can actually be a business. That's by holding it and having it short stays, less than seven days on average, and providing some kind of service like housekeeping. But if it's a long-term rental, you can't put it on Schedule C. However, some people are thinking, you know what, the IRS doesn't know I'll hurt them. So they go ahead and put it there. If you get caught doing that, you could actually be looking at a felony if it's a large enough mistake. That's because you absolutely are not being truthful on your return. It's more than just a mistake. That's, that is something they'll catch you on. At the worst, you're going to get taxes and penalties and additional penalties of up to 25%. Um, some others, just general, let's call it what it is. It's lying on the form. If you lie on your tax form, you can get yourself into a whole world of problems. Um, here's some of the common ones. If you have a flow-through entity like an LLC that taxes a partnership, the income is going to flow through as passive. The income or losses are going to show as passive. Now, there's a column that you report on your Schedule E for that. Now, where some people get it wrong is they take that Schedule K-1 that they've gotten from their LLC, and then they just report it as active on the Schedule E. Absolutely, this one gets, tar gets targeted by the IRS because they have a report of what that K-1 is. And so they're going to know if it doesn't get reported correctly on the Schedule E. The computer's going to pop it out. Now, there's a possibility it might slip through a crack somewhere. But the reality is, is the computer is set up to track this kind of problem. And that's one of those mistakes that uh, is not going to fly. You know, others might claim that they're real estate professionals and they don't really qualify. Now, I said I'm going to go through that. I'm going to make sure that I'm leaving enough time to go through that because I know we have a lot of people that are interested in that deduction, that real estate professional status deduction. But just now, I just want to make a note that there's very specific tests on what is and what is not a real estate professional, and the IRS is watching this one like a hawk. If you have an otherwise high-income job and you're taking a real estate professional status, you've got a very good chance of being audited. Now, that's not the end of the world. Just be ready for it and have your ducks in a row and know what record keeping you need. Um, another thing is that um, another problem is you can't change the character of the, your income. You know, I talked about that passive income or passive loss that comes from real estate, or as a business has ordinary loss. If you put your real estate inside of an S corp, it's still going to be real estate. It doesn't turn into a business because you've put it inside an S corp. And I see sometimes people try to make that change. And finally, people will sometimes set up a property management company whose sole job is to run their own properties. Now, you can have a property management company, absolutely, and it can be a business which would, unless it's in an entity, report it on the Schedule C. But if you set up your own property management company for the sole purpose of running your expenses over there that you otherwise couldn't deduct because of real estate expenses, that's not going to fly. Because if your property management company, its only job is to provide management services to your properties, then it's not going to qualify as a business. Best trick here, if you've got the licensing to do it, is bring it to do property management for a few other people. That then creates that legitimate business that's going to give you those deductions. But if it's just for you, you can get into trouble. OK, let's take a second and look at some of the very specific IRS targets right now. Um, if you're taking a real estate professional status exception, okay, real estate professional, in other words, what they're looking at is that you're spending enough hours in real estate activities and that you've got active or material participation with your property. They're going to want to take a look at what kind of hours you're spending. They, I always say they want to see the active and activity. They don't want to see that you're just reviewing financial statements or surfing on the Internet. They want to see you go out and look at property and actually talk, to be involved in what's going on. Um, another one that can be a problem is if you are holding your property inside of a limited partnership or a wrong kind of LLC, you could get a, uh, the IRS challenging it. What that means is if, if you have a limited partnership and your only interest is as a limited partner in that limited partnership, then the IRS may say that, hey, as a limited partner, that means you're not doing anything active. Therefore, you can't be active in this, and so none of it qualifies. Our recommendation is, is that you hold property inside of an LLC, a limited liability company, that is what we call manager-managed. There's manager-managed and member-managed. You want manager-managed, and you want to be named as one of the managers. 
So then it's very clear that you're actively participating. That's going to overcome any IRS objection. Now, they, the latest little rumor we're hearing is that the IRS is taking the position that if you have a property manager, then you either don't have that participation in the property you need, or else it's very hard to do it. Now, to that end, they have audited or, or selected for audit almost every property manager in Arizona. I'm not going to say every, although I've heard it from two sources. They're auditing every property manager in Arizona, every licensed property manager. And what they're doing is pulling the list of real estate investors. Uh, my guess is, is that they're then going to go to these real estate investors and see if they're trying to claim activity, that they're active in the properties. And if so, say, hey, you've got this property manager over here. How do I know you're really going to Arizona to check on your properties? And you're going to have to prove that. So they, they want to see that you're doing something. They want to see that you have proof of those hours. You know, if you, you go out and you check and you're walking around your property, Take a picture, you know, make sure you've got diary that shows your hours and what you're doing so you can prove it. Now, I've mentioned the real estate professional status a couple of times. I'm going to go ahead and open that can of worms just to go through the detail on this. Um, it, it can get a little on the complicated side and it might feel like, oh, I'm just going to take it anyway. Just be aware the IRS is really looking at this one. Again, the reason it's so popular is, is if you make over $150,000 a year, you can't take any real estate loss. But if you are a real estate professional, then you get it. Now, again, there's a lot of IRS scrutiny right now, so you have to follow the rules. First of all, you need to have at least 750 hours a year in real estate activities, and at least as many hours in real estate activities as you do in any other trader business. So I sometimes run into people that maybe have a full-time job, and they say, I'm going to go get my real estate license, therefore I'm a real estate professional. It's like, well, you might get the 750 hours on that, but you've got to have more hours than that than you do your other business. So you're going to have to prove, like if you're working 40 hours a week, you've got to be proved that you're working 41 hours a week in real estate. And that can get hard. Now, if you are making that claim, though, make sure you're tracking your hours, both at your other job or business, and your real estate, because they're going to want to look at that. Now, the second part is, is that you also have to have material participation in the property. Now, the definition of that is that you need to have 500 hours or more per property per year in activity. So there's the real estate professional, which is what you do. You could be a real estate agent, real estate broker. As long as you don't have any other business that has more hours, you're going to qualify there. But then you also need to spend that time with the property. Now, real estate professional hours, that 750, have to be either you or your spouse. You can't combine. But in the case of the material participation, you can combine hours. Now, additionally, if you have a bunch of property, you might want to consider doing something we call an aggregation. Now, what that means is, remember I said 500 hours per property? You got 10 properties? That means 5,000 hours. But what you can do is make an election on your return to say, treat all of these properties as a group, and then all you have to do is meet one 500-hour requirement. Now, I'm just going to caution you, there can be a downside to that. If you sell a property in that group at a loss, you can't take an immediate tax deduction for the loss unless you de-aggregate the, gr the group first. If your head is spinning, that's OK. Just, I just want to make sure that you're familiar with these terms so that when it comes time and you run into that, you know what you need to talk to your tax professional about. Um, let me just give you an example of what can happen when you mess up on the real estate professional deduction. This is a court case and not one of my clients, thank goodness. But in this case, the taxpayer was an engineer. And he and his wife filed using that real estate professional status. And the reason was because they had a high income and they had a bunch of real estate losses. By the way, they did their own return. So the IRS said, no, you can't do that. They took it on to tax court. Now, it's interesting. The judge in this particular case really bent over backwards trying to help out this engineer and his wife because I think he was thinking they were the underdogs against the IRS because they wanted to represent themselves as well. Now, the problem was the engineer said all the wrong things. You know, like they always say, the lawyer who represents himself has got the fool for a client or however that goes. In other words, don't represent yourself. But he, the problem was he didn't really understand all the rules. And he didn't know that he needed to have good documentation of hours and that the hours needed to be clearly activities. And that's where he got hung up. He didn't have enough hours. And the IRS does have a list of what works and what doesn't. 
Now, the last draw was it was really clear they were losing the real estate professional data, battle, and so they decided to throw the software, which was TurboTax, under the bus. The engineer's argument was that he bought TurboTax at the lo local Costco, and he just followed the software's instructions. No one ever told him he needed to document things and what actually qualified and how he was supposed to keep the records. And then the judge just totally got mad, and he threw the case out. In fact, he said that if somebody was as smart as the taxpayer realized that this was complicated, then he should have done more than just buy off-the-shelf cheap software and try to act as his own real estate tax advisor. So not only did they get hit with the taxes, the penalties, and interest, they got a material misstatement penalty of 20%, and they barely escaped, believe it or not, getting a jail term on this one because the number was so big, and the judge decided that that was it was material what they had done, and it was deliberate. It wasn't just a stupid mistake. They did it on purpose. So that's the kind of things we're up against right now with the IRS. They're very actively looking at the real estate losses and making sure that what that you've got what really you, you need to take that deduction. In just the next couple of minutes before we take questions, I just want to run through some strategies to make sure you do this right. I've talked about all the bad stuff. Now let's talk about some good stuff. Okay. Number one, you want to make sure you're using the right structure. Um, in general, that means learning about structures. Uh, one of the things that might work where you're at is something called a series LLC. That, that is a great entity because you only have to set it up once. And then you set up these cells. It's the ultimate in privacy, flexibility, and it's way cheaper. It's a little more expensive to set up in the beginning, but then once it's going, it's better. Um, or you may want a straight LLC. But the bottom line is you need to understand what is the best structure for where you are. Next, you need to be able to maintain it. Setting up the right structure isn't enough. You need to make sure you've got annual minutes, you've got the right agreements, you're, you're following the uh, corporate formalities that you need to have. My favorite, you need to have a good accounting system. Um, this is something, you know, I could talk for a whole hour on this one. Bottom line, you keep the deductions you track. I'm going to say that again. You keep the deductions you track back. If you don't keep track of them, you're not going to get them. So if you're too busy running your real estate investments and going out and making money to track your deductions, you're going to pay more tax. Real estate tax is tricky, though, so don't assume that you're going to know because you know some bookkeeping with your business, you're going to understand all the ins and outs of real estate accounting. It is a little more difficult to know. Um, make sure you've got a system for good record keeping. Uh, on the screen, I'm showing some ways you might use your smartphone, you might use a paper diary. Um, uh, my partner likes to take pictures of just everything and store her pictures. So she, it's a good way to document what she's doing. Next one, make sure you're taking all your legal tax deductions. Um, we talked about depreciation, but there's also a lot of other things you can take as deductions as long as you're tracking the right things. And this next one, if you're going to be dumping bad real estate, make sure you strategize before you get rid of it. You've got real estate losses. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but it, you've got losses as you, you're holding the property. Figure out the best way to take those deductions so you're not getting set with something. And finally, just making sure you're planning for your real estate. I think the bottom line is just having a good strategy. What you're seeing right now on the slides are our products. And I'm going to just end up with a very quick, well, the, the bottom line, as you know, working with Matt, is where will real estate take you? You've got a great, example, great chance of having passive income and tax breaks, or you could just end up with a lot of tax problems and losses. The difference is planning for it and taking advantage of it. Sorry, I'm trying to play with my screen a little bit. Here we go. I'm just going to jump right down to a special offer that we've got for Matt's people. You saw all of our real estate portfolio that we've got. If you added up all of those products right now to go to my site, it's a little over $1,300. For the next 10 days, if you go to realestateloopholes.com, it will give you all of those, plus a copy of the tax-free real estate investments, how to use your pension to buy real estate, and quick tricks to track expenses. For anybody who's on the go, these are how you can use some smartphone apps and some other tricks to make sure you're keeping track of all of those expenses so you get them. Plus, we're going to give you two coaching sessions for $2.99. And with that, I am on time, Matt. I'm turning it over to you for some questions. Wow, I am impressed, Diane. That was 
Awesome. Let me just do a, a quick sort of check-in here with everybody that's uh, on the webinar. How many people? Uh, how many people felt that was your your heads are spinning a little bit, uh, you, and you felt that that was uh, a lot of information in a short period of time, and some of it may have been a little bit uh, over your head. Go ahead and raise your hand because uh, I know we have we have a wide range of people on these webinars, and you know for people that are that are raising their hand now, that's totally okay. You know because we have folks that are that are beginners and they're just getting into the real estate investing space and they're just starting to learn about the importance of tax strategies and real estate deductions and that kind of stuff and of course we have people that are very experienced that have you know read all day and stuff and are just uh, you know just here for the latest update so wherever you are you know it's totally okay it's great that you were on this webinar uh, we did record it uh, and so we're gonna send you out a recording of it so one of the things to do if it was you know the information went either over your head or it went too quickly is you can listen to the replay uh, and when you take it in a second time you know maybe you, you don't have to take notes as much the second time and you're kind of just listening to it uh, repeated a lot of that stuff will sink uh, in more at that time and also of course if you want to take the next step uh, and really continue your education, uh, Diane's uh, educational products uh, as well as her books are, are, are as I said, I mean, that, that is the most substantive content that I know of, uh, and that is the way that I educated myself uh, on, on all these issues um, as I was coming up as a real estate investor. Uh, as well as then, you know, in, into the real estate agent broker business uh, side of things as well. So uh, that's an awesome offer, Diane, that you put out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, folks will uh, will take advantage of that. We appreciate the special deals. Um, now, so go ahead, folks, and you can start entering in your questions. They've already started coming in. Uh, you know, even if you're new to real estate and you're new to tax strategy and, and all this kind of stuff, it is a great opportunity to ask a question to Diane Kennedy. She's obviously uh, an incredibly prolific, uh, uh, productive, and successful uh, business owner, CPA, real estate investor, and so forth. And it's not often that you're going to get her time. It's not often that you're going to be able to get in front of her where she can answer your personal questions. So, you know, uh, feel free to just ask uh, what's on your mind here. And uh, this is a, a unique and I think very valuable opportunity. So we're going to kick it off here and start the question portion. Uh, okay, Dan. I'm just going to start reading this sure. uh, these questions here as they come in. Uh, and I, by the way, I know that I went through that stuff really fast. Yeah. Um, and I have to say that it was a case of there was so much new information that has happened that if if it, it, for people that have kind of been around this for a lot of years, uh, if you're left with just the idea there's some things you need to check on, then I've done my job here because it's there have been a lot of changes and we need to be careful now uh, and. Be very strategic in how you take advantage of the tax break. Exactly, and I, you know, and like I said, now with the rec recording of the webinar, you know, I mean, I view yeah. that like the same way that I, I view a, a book. You know, when I read mm -hmm. one of your books, I am there with a pen and a highlighter, you know, whatever you use, and I underline those books, the important stuff, and then when I'm finished with, it, I'm like, wait a minute. Let me go back and review all that stuff that I underlined, which were the important points, the things that applied to me, the stuff I wanted to take mm -hmm. out, and then I'll take this up I underlined and put it into my notes or my discussion to have, you know, with 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 my CPA, which which is now of course you, uh, and so forth. So you know, always, I mean, with good quality content, definitely watching it again and and letting it sink in a couple times is an important way to, you know, to approach it uh, and to consume it. Um, Okay, Diane, here we go with the questions. Uh, first question, real estate professional status only affects when only affects you when you have a loss in real estate and you are trying to offset your other income against that loss, but the real estate professional status does not come into play when you are having a profit from your real estate portfolio. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, it is correct. Um, th this would be my comment. First of all, congratulations if they're showing a you know, big profit while they're holding real estate. I would, at that point, my advice is to really look into maximizing your depreciation. Uh, I like to, with my clients, I like to say is you're never going to pay a dime of tax on real estate you hold because we can almost always find enough to offset any income and cash flow you've got from the real estate. So wonderful place to be in. Awesome. Okay. Second question, 
do you recommend purchasing a fixer using your 401k? Um, you, you would need to have, a, the, I'm going to guess it's a solo 401k because that's the kind that will allow you to self-direct. Um, if it's a 401k, like at a, uh, you're working for somebody else and it's a 401k they hold, um, I don't know that they're going to let you do that within that 401k. Uh, if you take money out early and you pay a penalty, I don't recommend that. Um, just because why pay a penalty if you don't have to? If it's your only funds, then perhaps. I, I, I think I would need to know more about that particular situation. But in general, if you've got a self-directed pension plan, whether it's a solo 401k or an IRA or a SEP IRA, um, I think that, that that's a great what place to put your real estate, especially if it's going to show a lot of appreciation. Yeah, absolutely. You for your taxes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I talk about in that tax-free real estate investment. I, you know, Diane, that, I was just going to mention that that's actually one of my favorite books uh, and probably one of my most heavily underlined books. It's the one you guys see here on the screen, the, the uh, mm -hmm. red-colored one, Tax-Free Real Estate Investments, because it really dives into the solo Roth 401k, which is one of the most awesome uh, <laughs> awesome vehicles that there is and a lot of people don't know about it. So that's a really, really substantive book if you're if you're looking to pick one up and learn about how to buy real estate in your IRA. And in terms of uh, at Maverick, we have a lot of our clients uh, that do exactly that. They get a self-directed IRA. Uh, there's a handful mm -hmm. of, uh, of reputable self-directed IRA companies. And once you have your money in a self-directed IRA or a solo 401k or some vehicle that allows you to do that, you can then purchase uh, real estate. So we have a lot of our clients uh, that are doing exactly that. You know, and the thing is, um, I, I sometimes I think people get into that because that's where the funds are. We can use that to free up money to invest, which is a great strategy. But when you start making money, especially if you're doing like we started off with that idea of a flip, and you can get big chunks of change with a flip. And just think about that. You know, if you're making twenty, thirty thousand dollars on every flip, do you want to pay tax on it? And if you don't. It's you've got more money in the game for the next one, and it just when you do the table on not having the tax come out, you can get richer much faster by not paying the taxes. Exactly, and especially when you're buying at the low end of yeah. the market and the early stage of an expansion cycle. For people that are getting into the game now and buying their real estate and building their portfolio at these current prices, and they're going to be positioned to ride the wave as the real estate market comes back. Uh, it's an incredible vehicle for uh, a tax sheltered vehicle for doing that. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure that you've already used this quote, but if you haven't, Warren Buffett's comment that he made earlier this year when he said if he could, he'd be buying hundreds of thousands of single family homes. Exactly. Yeah, that was an amazing. This is the, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was absolutely that. That really was was incredible. So, uh, absolutely, it is the time to do that, and smart investors are doing just that. So you can pick up one of Diane's uh, 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 books here, uh, or or you can even email us at Maverick, and we have connections with some of these self directed IRA companies, and they can get you into uh, that type of vehicle, so you can start doing that if you're interested. Um, okay, great. So next question: How will accelerated depreciation, such as the go zone properties, be treated? if later there is a short sale or a foreclosure? Okay, now that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, 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 your group always stumps me on something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the go zone tax credit, um, on a short sale, I'm going to, you know, I don't know. I don't even want to take a guess on what happens with that. Well, how would it work? How would it work with regular depreciation, Diane? Like, let's with say you, you own a property, you own, you own a property for like ten years, and you depreciate yeah. on the regular schedule for ten yeah. years, and all of a sudden it forecloses. What happens to the depreciation you no, took? Nothing. There's nothing you do with it. It's the same as if you sell a property for a loss. If you sell a property for a loss, then you don't have to pay any tax on the depreciation you have to recapture. Okay. Okay. So it goes on, yeah, I'm, if I'm thinking it's going to be the same, but I'm not positive on that. Right, because it's probably, it's just an acceleration of that, so it would be, you know, right. it's, it's like, you know, it's just, it just gets there quicker, but hopefully the, uh, uh, but we, we can look into that, though, uh, yeah, for for this uh, person, if they want to shoot us an email or something like that, Perfect. we can try yeah, to look you do into that. that yeah, if you want to do that, Matt, and send it on to me, I'm happy to respond. Yeah, absolutely. We want to make sure we get everybody the, uh, the correct answers on these questions. They're really good, uh, substantive questions, so just shoot us that email. Um, and uh, we'll get it over to Diane to make sure we get you the correct answer on that one. Um, okay. All right. I'm going to try to just read this here. I don't know if this is starting 
in the middle of a sentence or not. It says foreclosure versus short sale regarding tax for forgiveness, foreclosure on mm -hmm. loan amount or short sale on the sale market value. I don't know if I understand right. that. Yeah, let me jump in because I have a sense of where they're going with that. Okay. Um, if, if you have a foreclosure, uh, then you're going to get that Form 1099-A. And this is the change that the IRS has recently made. And I, I think this is, we're just starting to hear about this at my level, you know, CPAs who are actively working with the IRS on specific issues. But we're going to see in the next six months, I think it's going to be a huge problem for a lot of people. Um, but the fact is that that 1099-A, if you've got a foreclosure, then they're going to say you've got debt forgiveness right then. Now, the advantage, if you will, with a short sale is it's a finite number. When it's done, you know exactly how much the bank made, how much all the costs were. You know what the debt forgiveness is. There's no question you would have that debt forgiveness amount as a certain number when the short sale is done. Foreclosure is a little less certain, and that, that is what I see as the problem. Now, remember, if you've got this and you're panicking, oh, my gosh, I've got to pay tax on this, you want to take a look at the, if you see if you qualify under the bankruptcy, the insolvency, or the uh, principal residence. Additionally, there's one other way you can qualify as long as you make this election on the first tax filing. So you don't go back two years and amend it. You can't do it. But if you have multiple properties and you have one you did this short sale or foreclosure on, and you don't qualify under anything else, you can still avoid having to pay tax on that debt forgiveness by making this election that distributes out basis. And it's complicated, but just know if you have other property, make sure you know somebody who is familiar with making that election on your tax return. So you're kind of talking to maybe a little uh, more uh, real estate expert of a CPA than an average CPA. Great. And I want to let you know also, Dan, we're getting a lot of comments in the question box that say things like wonderful presentation, great content, very substantive, uh, and, and so forth. So I wanted to let you know uh, you're oh, getting a you. lot of thank that you. kind of feedback. Um, okay. On with the, uh, with the question questions. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, I flipped two properties with a partner, and I reported my 50% of the capital gain. However, yes. my partner did not report her 50%. The problem is that I did not issue a 1099. Everything was in my name. What can I do yep. to protect myself after the fact? Um, he didn't happen to say what year that happened in? Uh, did not say what year, no. You know, I would almost be tempted, if, it, if we're talking a large amount of money, I might be tempted to do a late 1099. So, And there will be a penalty for that, just so you know. But it's not a huge penalty. We're talking... Oh, I mean, it's, it's certainly just maybe at most $100 or $200 in the penalty for doing a late 1099. But I would probably do the 1099 now. Uh, it might mean rustling up an old form, but you can find that stuff online. And go ahead and report it, because otherwise you're going to get stuck with all of it. And if it gets, uh, and that's kind of a, a the, the thing is it's going to be an easy thing for the IRS to find. That There was a, a sale, a 1099S, I'm guessing, there was something that showed this sale amount and you only reported half of it, and the question is going to be, where's the other half? Because it doesn't match up. So having a 1099 you can show will be real important. Great. Okay, next question. I wasn't aware of all the of all the do's and don'ts if you do your own property management. So does one of your books go into greater detail on this subject? Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, I, the, the part that we talk more about that is in the tax deduction. Um, it wasn't a book. It's actually a home study course, and it's one of the things that's included in the real estate accounting in a box, Great. where it talks about what uh, the tax treatment and when you can take what kind of deduction. Great. Or where you can take it is a better way to say it. Okay. Uh, next question. When you say do not have income over $100,000, is that before or after tax deductions? That, that's actually the, what we call the adjusted gross income. So if you picture your 1040, it's at the bottom of that first page, so it would include your interest income and your dividends and your W-2 employee part, but less any IRA contributions, you know, the, the things that you subtract on that front page, but not the things you deduct, like for your home mortgage and property tax. Okay. All right, next question. If you have shown a loss beforehand and then quit the status because you realized that you are not making enough money as a real estate professional, 
will you have to pay back the losses that you took out beforehand, say, in no. the past two or three years? No, as long as you were qualifying in those years. So let's say you were working actively in the, as a real estate agent in 2009, 2010, 2011 you quit. That's fine. 2009 and 2010 can still stand on their own. Great. That's a good question. I've never been asked that before. It is a good question. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Is there a time frame associated with your website, or can we purchase your books at any time? Um, you can purchase the books standalone anytime at uspaxaid.com. The special offer, I mean, if you go and look at the prices, you'll see the special offer is a pretty good deal, and that's only for 10 days at realestateloopholes.com. Great. Um, okay. Do any of your books address the problems, and what do you do when you are a victim of an illegal loan modification? Ooh. Um, I don't know. Like, somebody took your money and didn't do the loan mod or something, I guess? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know what that's that... That's almost sounding like a criminal procedure. Um, I, 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 my, my, first of all, anything that's illegal is truly illegal and that's fraud, and there's a court case on it. Yes, that is a deduction. But generally speaking, you need to have a court case or criminal proceedings for that to work. Um, unfortunately, I've got some clients that got caught up in Ponzi schemes and you know Florida real estate where the things never got built and all of that, and huge amounts that they lost. And, but we had to wait for the criminal procedure, or in this case, they all just copped the plea and went to jail. And we had to wait for that in order for us to take the deduction. Okay. Uh, oh, Dan, the, uh, uh, the the answer to the question about what year did uh, did the uh, property flip take place? It was in two thousand and nine. That question okay. answered a couple months back. So. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's what we call an open year, so you can still go ahead and, and do the ten ninety nine. Um, right now, the IRS is actually auditing two thousand nine, so it might be a good idea to do that fairly soon. Right. Um, okay, we've got a, a couple of real estate uh, brokers on the call that are asking if they can extend this offer to their clients to get the discount on the accountant in the box uh, uh, over the next 10 days. Can they uh, offer that to their clients to take advantage of as well? Yes, they can. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Absolutely. Great. So so here's what we're going to do, folks. We are going to uh, send a recording of this webinar out to everybody uh, that's on the webinar. And what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to forward that to your clients. Okay. So they're going to be able to come and see the webinar that you saw tonight. They're going to be able to see the offer and they're going to be able to go to this um, this website and take advantage of that. So that's how I'd probably encourage you to do it. If you want to package it up and just send them an email, you know, and just, you know, include the website and the offer. You can summarize it yourself if you think that's easier or they won't watch the whole webinar. You're welcome to do that as well. So however you'd like to do it, it is available to you and your clients for the next 10 days. Um, okay, let's see here. A couple people say they will be buying the package this week. <laughs> Uh, um, and don't forget the coaching. You're going to get an email from my partner about this, but the, the package does include two coaching sessions. And that's awesome. that, what we love to do is if you can get kind of through the information, it's, most of it's digital downloads, you're going to get it right away. And, it, it, you know, that will help you kind of put together the things you want to talk about in the coaching session. But I, I love those. I mean, it's like, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. This is fun strategy. That's awesome. Well, I, I, when I was doing my coaching sessions with you, Diane, those were some yeah. of the most valuable, uh, uh, you know, some of the most valuable things for me as well. So two free coaching sessions, uh, that's, or, or, or included in the price, that's a, that's an awesome deal. So I would highly encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, I've certainly personally benefited a lot from my own coaching sessions um, with Diane and her company. Um, a couple more questions here, Diane. Um, can you speak briefly about the tax planning or tax issues relating to buying discounted distressed notes and doing workouts or foreclosures? Oh, now that's interesting. Well, that's that's kind of, that's actually taking it a little step of removed from the the real estate itself. And and what we're talking about then, as I'm understanding, we're just trading notes here. So we're buying the underlying notes, correct? A discount. Uh, I believe that's right, buying the discounted notes, but then if you do a workout or you do a foreclosure, 
Um, oh, then you take the property. Okay, okay. So just let me do a little bit of a quick checklist on some of the things to be aware of. Um, first of all, the, when you're, the business, and it is a business of buying notes. It, it is not a real estate business, per se. And so it's a business which means that you've got income, you've got losses, and it's going to come through as ordinary income and ordinary losses, like any other kind of business. Now, if there's this underlying note and you end up with a property, some of the things that you're going to need to look at is what it are is basis in that property, and so that becomes then the amount that you depreciate if you're holding it as a rental, etc. What are considered intangible assets, and those are the things you amortize. Um, probably the thing we're most familiar with would be like points on a loan that are things that you amortize. And then finally, what are some of the current expenses that you can expense right away? Because you're probably going to have legal expenses going and getting that um, property. So how much of that do you have to then capitalize and, am and depreciate over time or amortize over time, and how much can you immediately take expenses on? The, um, the part with the, the, the key, I think, in all of that is going to be, uh, in my mind anyway, I'm thinking of commercial properties, and maybe there are things that don't have tenants, and so it's going to take a little bit to get them in service. Um, anytime you have those kinds of issues, you want to get things put in service very quickly, and um, it opens up. Commercial real estate accounting is kind of like a whole its own issue, for example, tenant improvements. You know, we want to make sure we do as much tenant improvements instead of real property structure. So I would say the bottom line is is that make sure that you're talking to your real estate accountants early on in the process, so that you're setting this up right. And the way you foreclose on the property and the way you expense things can make a difference on whether it's a current expense or capitalized. And then, as if you have to do improvements, how you do that and how quick do you get it in service? Great. Um, okay, next question. If we qualify as a real estate professional because we are a full-time real estate agent, do we also need to meet the 500-hour material participation requirement? Yes. Uh, and that is a really common misunderstanding. It, there is, it's a two-part test. One is that real estate professional hours. And then the other is that what's called material participation. It's 500 hours. Now, it could be that if you're, let's say you're not a real estate broker, it, well, your whole business is taking care of your properties. They, the hours could be one and the same. Or it could be that you're a real estate broker and you're working with other people and then you also have to spend hours on your property. And they're two separate things. Okay. Um... And there's a follow-up question. If I own multiple properties in multiple states, uh, what is the reasonable expectation for material participation? Um, you, you know, the, what the problem is is that the IRS is probably going to be harder on you because they're going to say, hey, you live over there in California. How do we know you're really going over to Mississippi to look at your property? You've got a property manager. You never go there. So... Being able to prove that you're physically at that location is going to be important, and that you're participating on phone calls, and you know you're actively involved in what's going on. That that'll be the, the test that you need to prove. And again, remember though that material participation is if you make that election to aggregate them all, you only have one five hundred. So I'll just assume you're in California, you got two properties in California, everything else is scattered across the country. Maybe most of your time is spent on your California properties. Because they're all in the same group, that's okay. Right, and when you're and when you're uh, communicating with your property managers or you know your you know anybody else that's doing anything relating to your properties in your out of state locations, just keep track of all your emails, keep track of your phone calls, and keep track of the you know any time that you're spending researching even the market or you know doing something relating to your investments. Certainly, obviously, a trip into town as well, and just documenting all that stuff really carefully, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, I like. I, I personally use a, a function on my computer where I keep track of all my appointments, and every day I just fill it in on what I'm doing. Uh, it's, whatever your method is, keep track of what you're doing with your properties. Awesome. Well, Diane, I think we're gonna uh, we're gonna end it there. Uh, you've uh, you've stayed with us uh, certainly over an hour. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, comments coming in about great presentation. Thank you so much uh, for that. I would uh, echo that, of course, and thank you for your time answering everybody's questions. This is always uh, oh, a really valuable I event. So thank you for being here. And thank you guys all for sharing some time this evening. Thank you, Matt. All right, Diane. Thanks. Have a great night. Bye. Bye, everybody.